Good evening. Welcome to The Journey Home. My guest tonight is a guest that I have looked forward to having on the program for a long time. He's a, a man that, in fact, has had uh, impact on my own life let's see, since I was at least five, six, or seven <laughs> years old uh, in many different ways, maybe different than he's having an impact right now. But uh, and my guess is that many of you have heard him, uh, know of him, especially if you're uh, my age, maybe just a tad older, you were very much aware of his music. My guest tonight is Dion DeMucci. You knew him as Dion. And some of his songs, The Wanderer, Why Must I Be a Teenager in Love, uh, and one that I remember so strongly from the late 60s was Abraham, Martin, and John. But he's here to talk about his journey, his spiritual journey, back to the church of his childhood. And I, it's a, I want you to pray for us tonight. He's much more comfortable if he had a guitar up here. <laughs> is that an uh, understatement? <laughs> I'd love to open with a song. You know. Well, actually, I'd like you to do that. First, remember, you're part, important part of the program. I've got to get the phone number in. If you want to call us with a question, start getting those questions coming at 1-800-221-9460. And if you'd like to send a question by email, it's journeyhome at EWTN.com. Dion, welcome. Great to be here. Oh, it's, it is super. So We've talked for off and on for a year, right? Well, you're one of the reasons why I'm here. Well, we'll talk about that. But Absolutely. just in case... They don't remember. Give them a taste. Are you kidding? Okay, everybody. <laughs> Each night I ask the stars up above. Come on. Why must I be a teenager in love? I'm bringing them on the road with me. <laughs> they sound better than the Belmonts, and they're cheaper. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of flustered here only because I wish I was singing some more songs I, I, with you. you I know? wanted to say one thing before yeah. we start. I don't know if everyone here or everyone out there knows how well you play piano. Uh, I met Marcus on a cruise, and I was doing Abraham, Martin, and John one night for the crew and for some of uh, uh, your okay. friends. And he sits down at the piano and follows me with... Well, I didn't I, do too good on the bebop stuff, but I, Abraham, Martin, and John. That's I, a rough song. And that made my life in many ways. Uh, I've you, always loved he that plays. song and the privilege of being able not only to play with that you, was fun. but I have your hand autographed copy of when you wrote down the chords and the words to make sure I could keep up with you. That's framed. So, but anyway, and let's. My wife loved your wife, and I'm married to uh, Susan. I just want to say. 36 years. Oh, praise I'll, God. I'll tell you a little about that later on, but she. This woman has taught me a lot about loyalty, about uh, integrity, mm -hmm. and about honesty, mm -hmm. and, uh, and blessing in my life. <laughs> patience? Yes, <laughs> which I have none. <laughs> um, only to the extent I let the Lord, uh, I'm, if I'm spiritually fit today, I have some patience in my life. Well, I will mention that uh, the audience will be able to hear some of your music. You sang some last night on the Life on the Rock program, yeah. which will be replayed a couple times this coming week. And also, you taped a program as the guest with Jeff on Life yeah. in the Rock, which will be broadcast in September. And mm -hmm. so you'll have the opportunity to hear some of his music, even some of your gospel stuff, I think, right? Yeah. But uh, on our, our time <laughs> goes so quickly on the journey home. Let's give them some of the background of your spiritual journey through all those years of the music that they know more about. Let's hear your spiritual stuff. I'm going to try and get this into uh, uh, the time we have. I was born and raised in Bronx, New York City, and I was uh, baptized and confirmed in Mount Carmel Catholic Church, a little cathedral in the middle of uh, Bronx, New York City, and uh, the hub of our neighborhood. Uh, my mom and dad, my mom is precious. She's, uh, my parents are still living, but uh, God wasn't important in our family. Uh, uh, religion, uh, the church, it wasn't necessary. And uh, being from this macho Italian neighborhood, uh, the guys, you know, I, I never heard anybody talk about loving Jesus or, it, it's, it seemed suited for old ladies, uh, sissies, weak people. So I think uh, maybe at the age of 13 in those real vulnerable, tender, impressionable years, just the, the lure of the streets, the gangs, being cool. I'll run my own life. You know, with, with my parents, like, 
arguing all the time. I mean, they really had a, uh, a rough time communicating because both their parents were alcoholics. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think both my grandfathers drank pretty good. So they, they, they didn't know too much about communicating. <laughs> and uh, there I am out on the streets, and uh, my uncle gets me a guitar when I'm about 13, and I got caught up in the music of uh, Hank Williams and when was this about? Blues, I would say early 50s, okay. you know? Yeah. I'm listening to uh, uh, Reverend Gary Davis on the streets of Bronx, New York City, and John Lee Hooker. And then, see, rock and roll didn't exist when I was a kid. We, we, would dev we were just creating it. There was no rock and roll. There was no teenage music. And, uh, you know, I was hearing like, Get down and boogie, don't bond, get down, we gone boogie and you know. You just woke a lot of people up at home. I'm like, I, think so. <laughs> I love this, th you know. And the, my, <laughs> my teachers at uh, junior high school, the, or you know, wherever I was, whatever grade I was in at that time, thought I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I couldn't wait to get out of school no. to go sit at the feet of Reverend Gary Davis and listen to what he was doing. And uh, I think maybe at the age of 15. I discovered, I was a rebel by that, by that time. I was like out on the streets, a rebel without a cause, hanging out. And I discovered drugs and also fell in love with Susan. Hmm. Susan moved down from Vermont to Bronx, New York City. And I never knew they grew anything as beautiful as Susan up in Vermont. <laughs> she walked down the streets in a clean country air, followed her down the streets, and so did I. I was like, <laughs> Sue, you know, and I would sing to her, hey, Susie. You know, I'd be trying to get her attention and trying to, you know, like impress her. And uh, I fell in love. Uh, there I was. Uh, I think about that time, I started putting some songs together. And there was a, a songwriter in my neighborhood, an aspiring songwriter, brought me down to a company that was just starting out, Lori Records. I went down there and sang. Teenager in love, you know. I was about 16. Sign that boy. Who is he? What's his name? And I went back to my neighborhood and I gathered up the best doo-wop singers in my neighborhood, brought them down. It was the beginning of Dion and the Belmonts. Uh, the next five years were a whirlwind of top TV shows and hit records and movies and concerts and worldwide touring. I was with Chuck. Barry, Little Richard, Roy Orbison, the Everly Brothers. I mean, we were creating this music. Everybody had a different brand. Uh, at the age of 19, I went on tour with Buddy Holly and Richie Valance. We, uh, we started the tour out in Chicago. It was called the Winter Dance Party. We were in the Midwest, 30 below zero, riding in a yellow school bus, none of these, you know, yeah, dolled up fancy. buses that they, the country singers had these days. <laughs> it was a school bus. And uh, we were out there in the Midwest, and uh, Buddy Holly was from Lubbock, Texas. Richie Valance was from the Barrio in the San Fernando Valley from L.A. He was 17. Buddy Holly was 22. I was 19 from Bronx, New York City. Different cultures. And we're in the back of the bus, and we're like, ripping it man we're like rocking you know we we bonded we were having it we were writing songs i was singing songs like uh uh i'm gonna hug my radiator when i hit my hotel room it was so cold it was like you know so I, i'd be uh, uh nothing really matters when you're riding on a broken down bus all i got is you all you got is me just add it up and we got us i'm gonna hug my radiator hug my radiator hug you know like that and we're, we're rocking in the back of the bus, and it comes, we get to Clear Lake, Iowa, and Buddy Holly uh, starts recruiting people. He gets a bright idea to charter a plane, trying to get the headliners to, and in fact, Waylon Jennings was the bass player on that tour. He was hmm. one of the crickets. Uh, and Buddy Holly's trying to recruit uh, the headliners to get on, on the plane. My fare comes to about $36. Now, my parents, all I know is they argued every morning about my dad getting a job and the money, and they were paying $36 a month rent in Bronx, New York City. 
and just a light went off. My, I just couldn't see spending $36. My mind hadn't stretched to that <laughs> limit yet to $36 for a 45 minute plane ride. Now I'll take the bus. Richie was sick. Uh, the big bopper who was on that tour, he went and Buddy Holly. The next morning when we drove into Moorhead, Minnesota, it was almost like a summer's morning. It was like, it, I, I remember it being warm. Mm. The sun was out. I walked into the lobby of the hotel with Whale and Jennings and up on the wall of the, the lobby, there's a TV and he's saying that the, the plane crashed, killing all aboard, including the pilot. And uh, I was just, Marcus, I was like devastated because here I am, the best thing in my life that ever happened to me is I got a couple of hit records and I'm with these guys that I never knew life could be so much fun. We're rocking out and I figure like, life is getting good, it's getting safe and rock and roll's gonna save me, you know? I didn't know I had all those questions about who am I, where am I, why am I here, what's life about? You know, I was just like a rebel without a cause and I'm, you know, just enjoying it. But uh, now with this, uh, with this plane crash, it brings up a lot of questions. I'm baffled. Uh, I, you know, I didn't even want to recognize the fears I had. So, you know, it started, the drugs that I was using as a kid started just getting more. And when I got home, uh, we finished that tour with the help of uh, some people that came up out to the Midwest and help us finish it. When I got home to Bronx, New York City, uh, I started a solo career. And, uh, but my wife, well, she was my girl at that time, and I'm, I was living with my parents. She told me I was in shock for two weeks. I was sitting in the room singing Buddy Holly songs, Richie Valen songs, and I just, I, no one wanted to talk about it. I mean, there was, no one asked, you know, how you, you know, anything, it was just, life went on in the neighborhood. It was just, <laughs> so I started writing some, eventually I come out of that, and I uh, started writing about a lot of characters that were bigger than, seemed bigger than life in my neighborhood, like Runaround Sue, who was, it was really written about a, a girl named Roberta, but it, Roberta, it didn't rhyme with anything. I couldn't, you know, keep away from Runaround Roberta, it just, just didn't work. So, I, I, you know, and then I'm, The Wanderer was written about a guy named Jackie Burns. I think I'll just tell this story because you could see where we were coming from. Uh, there was a guy named Jackie Burns, he was a sailor, and every time he dated a girl, he'd get a name tattooed on his body. So he was like, Flo on my left arm, Mary on my right, Janie is the girl that I'll be with tonight. And when she asked me which one I love the best, I tear open my shirt and I show a rosy on my chest, cause I'm the wanderer, da da da, I'm the wanderer. <laughs> And, and the song is a very sad song, because it says, uh, I roam from town to town. I go through life without a care. I'm as happy as a clown with my two fists of iron, but I'm going nowhere. You know, and a lot of people never kind never of heard the words, you know, got the idea sad. that that was a sad song, you know, but in the 50s, everything had to be kind of like in a happy kind of presentation. So I'm doing these songs, and I'm, I, as far as my career, it's, I'm flying. I, I get a contract with Columbia Records, the first rock and roll artist signed to Columbia Records. Five-year guarantee. I, I'm like, my parents are, are arguing about the rent. Here I am. I make $2 million by the, by the age of 21. And that was when a million was a million. And uh, so I'm like... You know, no one in my family has ever won this big. You know, they're all uh, policemen, electricians, and great uncles, and I have huge Italian, 250 Italian relatives that all talk at once, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Listening is a whole new concept. Anyway, uh, doing all this, and you know, I'm just spinning my wheels, trying to grab onto something solid to give me some peace since the plane crash, since Buddy and Richie went down in the plane crash, and all these unanswered questions and fears that I didn't even admit I had. I was just trying to cover up and go faster. And 
And uh, the hit records are coming. I get a song called Ruby Baby, Donna the Prima Donna. I'm now with Colombia. They send us to Spain. I'm in Spain with Susan. And she's watching all this, uh, all the gauntlet of flash bulbs and the fans and the magazine articles and the people interviewing me and the TV uh, shows and all the attention. And one night we're in the room and she said, uh, Dion, is, is this it? Is this all you want? I'm thinking, what does she want, a bigger suite? What does she want? You know, thinking another hit record? I, this is a big, <laughs> I knew she was asking me something profound, but I, I, didn't, I couldn't go there. Yeah. I just didn't know what it was. And uh, I knew I was like, I felt like I was losing her. And I didn't want to lose her because I love this girl. And uh, I asked her to marry me. And uh, it was 1963. Uh, I was 23. And uh, she was... 21, maybe closer to 20. And uh, we got married. And I thought maybe the drugs would stop and I'll, you know, and this is what I need. I need to get married. Well, it got worse. You know, I didn't know alcohol and drugs uh, were a progressive illness that it, you know, I just didn't know that. And it got, it got worse. It got much worse. And the, uh, the mid 60s for me were the most emotional, the bleakest emotional period uh, in my life. It was like devastation. It was the restlessness, the, the discontent, the irritability, the, uh, if anyone knows, has an alcoholic in his family or a drug addict, you know the kind of self-centeredness they have. They, they don't know anybody. They blame everybody for everything that's going on in their life. And, I got like that. I was like, uh, and these were people that loved me. I was, uh, you just get into a blame game. I just wanted to say one thing, that uh, there's three stages to drinking and drugging. The first stage, a lot of fun. Second stage, fun and problems. Third stage, nothing but problems. So that's where I am. It's 1968, and I'm driven to my knees by alcohol and drugs, and I'm... Uh, probably at the lowest point in my life. Well, okay. At that point, I mean, the Lord, I mean, that's about the time that uh, that song that was such a different kind of song than your usual menu of songs comes out. Was, did that have something to do with your own conversion at that Well, in 19, that yes, uh, I, had a, I needed a change, so I took a geographical cure. Susan and I moved down to uh, Miami where my father-in-law lived. I didn't know him. Moved into the house, he starts talking to me about God. I didn't know he was, had, a, had a problem with alcohol and he was sober for many years. And uh, sitting at the table with him in the morning with his light blue eyes sparkling and he's like reading his prayer book and he's talking to me about God and he's saying, God's the answer, Dion. You just have to, just ask. Ask, you will receive, seek. You know, knock, the door will be open. I get on my knees one night in his house, in the back bedroom, and I said, God, I, I, I need help. I, I, I need your help. I, I'm, I've just been running. Just been changing my shoes, but I've been running. Uh, is there anything you could do for me? I, I, I want to place this in your hands. April 1st, which is really significant for me. April Fool's Day. I think drugs and alcohol were the biggest fool I ever got, but I haven't had a drink or a drug since April 1st, 1968. God. God, God just the grace of God. took it out of my life. Now that song came about right after that. I, I had new eyes. I could see maybe things from a spiritual perspective and put together Abraham, Martin, and John. And I think Four months later, it was number one in the country. It was like an anthem to a generation. Right. Basically saying, uh, you could kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. So I was trying to make a bad situation. I was trying to bring something good out of it. And that put me into uh, the coffee houses. And, and also, I must say that uh, what this did was 
I went into a, a program based on spiritual principles, like a 12-step program, mm -hmm. which actually is based on uh, the spiritual disciplines of Ignatius, uh, Ignatius of Loyola. And uh, what it does is it, if you work those steps, Marcus, it positions you to receive the free gift that God wants for all of us. And it positioned me. And the miracle happened. People uh, witnessing to me and uh, talking about Jesus. And, you know, there was, I, I became aware of God's power before I became aware of his reality because he took away my alcoholism. He took away the, the drug addiction. He, I didn't have it. Three beautiful daughters born to us in the, in the 70s. And uh, uh, one day uh, with, all this, with all these people telling me about Jesus, and I really didn't, it just, I never understood. I was baptized, I was confirmed. You know, and there's a Bible verse in Timothy, it says, uh, Paul's telling Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God that is in you by the laying on of my hands. And now, that had happened, but somebody came along and like fanned it, and it took a little while, but I had one morning and I went, I went out jogging, and I had a tremendous, profound, brilliant, sudden spiritual awakening. Uh, Lord Jesus really touched my life very deeply. And I've never been the same since. That had a big change in your career. You've done gospel albums. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, that... Uh, it was very different because now God... There was a book. There was letters. What he said. I could know him his character, his nature. There's, there's things he said. I want to know what he said. There's a God that created me, that made my eyes to see, sees me, made my ears to hear, and hears me, and knows me, and has a plan for my life. And I started reading the scriptures like it was a love letter to me, and uh, changed my life. And, and it changed your life, not back to the childhood faith of your Catholic faith, but uh, in Protestantism, very powerful. Uh, ministry you know, well, developing? Well, you know, Marcus, I looked into the Catholic Church, hmm. but uh, I didn't understand it. I, I, I didn't really have that understanding. So what happened, I, I didn't have a deep faith there. So what happened was I, I got pulled out where the exuberance and the volume was, and I thought that equaled truth. Hmm. You know, if they had great praise and worship and the preacher was like, you know, really teaching the word, you know, and, and it, I met so many beautiful people uh, through my thank God travels through Protestant churches and uh, ministering through, you know, writing songs very scripturally based and uh, great time, a lot of it. All right, well then what is it that, that uh, hit you on the side of the head and opened you up to the Catholic faith? Uh, I think the primary central issue was authority. You know, what is truth and who defines it? Um, I, was, I was in one church and I, I learned from Genesis to Revelation from that church. When I moved from North Miami up to Boca Raton, I went to another church. I was at the Bible study. Well, they're having a Bible study. The pastor asked me, I'm at his home, asks me a question. I kind of answer it. Everybody looks at me like a, I got a, I'm out in left field with a hockey stick. <laughs> well, I started finding out that there's a different teachings on baptism, on the Lord's Supper, on the Eucharist, on, the, on, uh, on salvation. I mean, essential issues. Uh, and then you, you start realizing that there's 35,000 denominations out there that, that are all saying, I have the Holy Spirit, and we teach, uh, if it's not in the book, we don't teach it, and, but everybody's teaching something different. There's a new church opening up every week, you know, in some shopping center. You could just take the book and open up a church, and uh, what is truth, and defining it, and, and uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to feel you know, any kind of solid foundation. I started, I was in this period, in this sense of like something was incomplete, something was missing. Now I know it was 
<laughs> the beauty of truth, the fullness of the church, 2,000 years of family history, rich tradition, you know, just the early fathers, this, this, this beautiful church I belong to now, but I didn't know it then. And I, it seemed to me that each individual believer had to acquire enough knowledge on his own uh, to, to choose or find the church that was going to lead him to an eternal life. It's like I picked the church of my choice or what I think the best church around is, not the church. What about the church that Jesus started? You know, entering that church on his terms, not on my terms. Now I'm like, I, I didn't know that then. You're recognizing a problem. Yeah, yeah, I was kind of... How'd the solution come into your life? <laughs> this show. I uh, was sitting back one night. I, I, well, I was catching Life on the Rock for a while, you know, listening to that. And EWTN had surfing the channels, and I come upon this show. Now, sitting in my chair one night, this, uh, my chair. <laughs> <laughs> in the old set, I think. <laughs> and uh, was, was a, an Episcopal priest, or uh, converted. Uh, Episcopal priest, John Haas, was sitting here uh, telling you that when he was an Episcopal priest, he had went on a pilgrimage to France, and a Dominican priest asked him, well, he was talking to this Dominican priest, and the, he was saying, you know, there's a lot of disputes and controversies in my church, and, uh, you know, ordaining women, yada, yada, on and on and on, and the priest said, well, Who's the authority in your church? And he said, well, the faith and practice of the early undivided church. Gave him like a seminarian uh, answer. <laughs> and the, the little Dominican priest asked him, uh, no, who's the living authority in your church? And John Haas thought about it. He was sitting here and he said, there was none. There was no one to settle disputes and controversies. And he said, that put him on the journey, and eventually he came, he found out that there was a church that did settle disputes and controversies. Now, that sat me up in my chair, and I was going, what? whoa, what's going on here? And uh, I started looking at some of the teachings that I just had accepted in a lot of the uh, things that I heard outside the church. Uh, so I started re-examining Matthew 16, 17 through 19, where Jesus uh, gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter. Uh, passes on, you know, that's the Davidic kingdom in light of Isaiah 22, 22, and says to him, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And the Catholic Church actually has the authority to bind you to its teaching. I mean, I th growing up, I thought it was a, a tyrant. I didn't know it was a, a servant, a custodian, uh, a humble keeper of the deposit of faith that Jesus gave it. And they just say, this is it. You, you either accept it or they, they have no right to change it, and they haven't changed it. It's been the same for 2,000 years. Uh, periodically, they define a doctrine, you know, uh, as time when there's controversies or uh, uh, a need of the yeah. time. Right. So how long ago was this? This was uh, about a year and a half ago. This was it? a year and a half ago. Now when I understood uh, the teaching authority in the church or of the church in the magisterium centered around the seat of Peter when I understood and accepted this doctrine then I could trust the church on everything else and, and after that it was like, <laughs> it was like somebody pulled the curtain open, and it was like another conversion for me. It was like when I first met Jesus. It was like I met Jesus, and I was trying to find his church. And then all of a sudden, the family was there, you know, the, the rich tradition, the communion of saints. I actually went to Mass one, one day, and uh, just the heavens opened up. I felt the communion of saints. I was crying. I went back to my church, uh, the church I left, Church of my youth, and went to confession, uh, Father Frank. And I walked in, I said, Father Frank, I said, I, I've been anti-Catholic. Everything I learned was, 
I thought I knew about the Catholic Church, but I learned all of it outside the church. What I thought I knew, I think there's a lot of people out there yeah. that I dislike like the, or against the Catholic. They don't even know what it teaches, mm -hmm. but they, they hate what they don't understand. And I said, I, I, I feel like I've been persecuting the body of Christ. And he said, Dion, <laughs> welcome home. And he, you know, and it was so beautiful for me. And I, 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 I just love being here. Dion, thank and you. And I want to thank you, Marcus. Well, you know. thank the network and the opportunity. And John Haas for his faithful witness. Yeah. You never know when you do a program who you might have a chance of witnessing to. And thank you, Dion. We're going to take a break now. We'll come back in a moment for your questions, both on phone and email for Dion. And he had chosen as a theme authority. That may come up in your questions, but I wanted to make sure you had this entire time to share his journey. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. My guest for this evening is Dion, and you may not know this, but he was recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame up in Cleveland, Ohio, and of course he's a well-respected uh, musician. Many, how many albums, records? A, a I have like over 40 albums. Wow. Well, you know, been around a while, Marcus. That's right. First generation rock and roller. To Yo. him who's given much, much is required. Absolutely. That's right. And we've been given a lot. That's right. That's right. That's right. Let's take our first phone call. This is Alan from Florida. Hello, Alan. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, uh, Dion. Um, I'm calling from Tampa. You were here in the early 80s at, at one of the uh, uh, downtown theaters. I don't know if you remember that or not, but I was in that audience. Uh, I was a newly born-again Christian in, in the early 80s, and um, I had I followed you and the music from... Um, uh, the early uh, 60s, and when I become a Christian, I didn't, uh, I had to leave that music behind, and you had such a profound effect on me with the music, that Christian music that you had. I bought a cassette, and I played it so much, I ruined it, but it, it was absolutely outstanding, and it's such an honor to talk with you, and I was wondering, do you have anything on the horizon or any music like that since. It's, this has been probably the middle 80s, if you remember. Well, you know, I did record uh, five uh, gospel albums, and uh, they were discontinued. Hmm. Uh, but Ace Music, uh, Ace Records, out of England, uh, came along and uh, reissued uh, the best of the gospel years. And I have a Great. CD that you could get uh, if you, if you go to any uh, record store and, and ask for it, just Ace Records and Dion and the best of the gospel years. Yeah, I, I, some of that music was, uh, it was wonderful uh, writing it and, prof you know, Favorite singing it. particular one of your songs that really speaks for your own journey? Well, I wrote a song called Center of My Life. It was the first song I wrote. It just came out of heaven. Uh, first Christian song. Yeah. yeah wow. uh, uh, gospel, so, yeah. And uh, it was, it's, it's so much fun. The words, a little bit. It's so much fun still yeah. writing uh, What are some songs. of the words, just for example? Uh, in this world there's a train bound for glory. Get aboard and I'll tell you a story about my Lord Jesus. He is the only one. If you run, you can seek foolish pleasures. Just get still and you'll find hidden treasures. My Lord Jesus, he shines bright as the sun. You know, he is the center of my life. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Is that one you did on Jeff's program? Yeah. Jeff? Good. So they'll be, be able to hear it sometime in the future. Let's take this first email. Dear Marcus and Dan, I just had some words with one of my teenagers about the television program she was watching. The sitcom wasn't an example of good Christian living, to be sure. My daughter is a great young woman and a wonderful daughter. How can I better explain the importance of prudent choices regarding the media she watches and listens to? How would you explain the impact media has on shaping young people's values sooner, if not later? Love and Mary, Connie. 
Oh, a Connie. father of daughters. Ah, three daughters. My daughters used to leave the house and I say, listen, you tell that boy you're going out with that you have an Italian father who's living. <laughs> <laughs> Intimidation, Connie. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> what, uh, you know, I, I lean on the positive. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, you kinda, I always focused on my, my love for Jesus and, and uh, spiritual principles and, uh, you know, those kind of choices. And, and it was kind of like an inside job. And then they could make their own decisions instead of always kind of badgering them with what's going on. Because the world is, I mean, it's culture of death, but, you know, Pope John uh, calls it. Yeah. And there's, you, you'll always be, you know, there's one thing I found out real early uh, that the Lord showed me uh, was that uh, I was trying to control situations, circumstances, and conditions. It never occurred to me that he wanted to change me to meet situations, circumstances, and conditions, and to, but to change me. I was, instead of, you know, focusing on that. Well, the key thing is that if we're going to tell our children you can't do that, and take these things out of their life. We've got to make sure that we have positive things that we can fill that void with. We've got to be able to see. We've got to show them, direct them. We, we've come through a generation where many parents, and uh, you know, I hope I'm not guilty of this, but many of us said, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave the choices up to my children. I'm not going to influence them. You let them. Well, if you don't do that, hey, you've thrown them out to the world. You know, I love my kids. I'm, I'm the only father on the block that plays music louder than his kids. You know <laughs> what I mean? And, uh, uh, but, you know, even with all my defects, and uh, uh, if, you, if you love them and, you, and are an example of what you're doing, eventually they, they start looking to those things. And being willing to say you're sorry to them. And say you're wrong, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had great, ex that's a, a wonderful thing to mm. call. One, one time I called my daughter in the room and I, I said, Tane, I said, uh, her name is Tane, I said, uh, I was wrong. I, I told a joke out there and it kind of, you know, it was, uh, uh, well, long story, but to, to say you're wrong is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Show you human. Let's take this next question. This comes from Virginia. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Yes, hi, Dion. <clears throat> uh, first of all, I want to say I'm really happy to speak with you. You've been a fan of mine for years, but my question is that a good friend of mine has a son, 17 years old who is drinking and drugging right now very badly. He wears a cross around his neck. He has a cross in his bedroom, but he has no religion. And I was just wondering, Dion, if you can tell me how I can help him. Well, Virginia, that's, uh, I have a lot of friends that I'm concerned with uh, mm -hmm. and uh, people in my life, that I, and, and prayer. You know, it's, uh, people were praying for me uh, I have a beautiful wife that always kept me in prayer, and uh, my lovely aunts who uh, really practiced the faith and, and loved the faith and prayed for me. And eventually, you know, it was open, and I understood. It's the Lord that converts, right? Yeah. It's the Lord that touches hearts, and, and we're I, witnesses. We're witnesses, and we we're part of the prayer army for people, and never give up on people. I mean, your own life is an example of never given up. Others who prayed for you, right, never dreamed. Not only that Dion would be Catholic, but they'd be Christian. Yeah. But you're a proof positive that the grace of God can change. I mean, if the guys in the neighborhood could only see me now <laughs> <laughs> on the journey Maybe home. they are. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Let's take this next. This comes from Nick Hoogs in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Dion. I'm overjoyed at seeing you on the journey home. I've been a fan of your music for 40 years and a collector, especially of your 60s hit music, to which I always found a spiritual side. I'm glad to see you doing so well. Thank you for your testimony. I'm a new Catholic. My greatest challenge is finding where all the faith is in the Catholics is that Catholics seem to have. I would appreciate if you could speak to that, quote, faith, small f, that you found in your conversion, the faith of the Catholics. Well, you know, I... I, uh, this, is, this is difficult. I had a lot of questions when I came into the Catholic Church, and uh, the catechism for me was a, a key. 
because the Catechism expresses the heart of the Catholic Church, and uh, it interprets uh, Scripture. It, that's the, our interpretation, uh, the Word and, 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 and the Catechism. Uh, I had a lot of questions, and you know, I'm Marcus. I, I hate to say this, but I'm leery about asking any Catholic I see <laughs> the answer to some of these things because I, uh, what kept me away from the Catholic Church in, in, in one respect is what Catholics do and practice and say in the name of Catholicism sometimes doesn't match up with the official teaching yeah. of the Church. So I have friends that I call that I, I res respect, like you know, my friend Tom Sullivan. I'm always <laughs> on the phone of Scott Hahn, yeah. he, he, uh, I, I, he took a liking to me, and uh, Dr. Scott Hahn's a great teacher, and I, I call him every once in a while, and hey, you know, up. I run something by him, and uh, t to, get, to get an answer that lines up with the Pope, with the Magisterium, with the Catechism, and uh, that's it's just powerful for me, and very, uh, gives me a lot of security. Well, we, it's a reminder that the Church uh, as long as there's people in it, we'll never be perfect this side of glory. Absolutely. You know, and uh, it's always in need of renewal. And where does renewal always begin? It begins right here. And we know people in our life that don't know their faith very well. Um, and maybe God's put us in their life to, to be a witness. Uh, you never know. So beginning with prayer for someone, lifting faithfully. I mean, that's the thing. Oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. And then I go play golf and never think about praying. If you say you're going to pray for somebody, pray for somebody because it's the most powerful thing we can do to help turn someone's heart. We've got another email from Terry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dion, can you speak on the differences between the way Catholics view the Blessed Sacrament and how the Lord's Supper is practiced in your former church? Do you now feel that you missed much without recognizing the Blessed Sacrament while you were not in the Catholic Church? From Terry. Oh, my heart. <laughs> My, thank you for that question, uh, because uh, <coughs> my heart just swells when I think of where I am right now. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean this uh, like to toss it off, but in a lot of churches, they practice uh, the real absence, <laughs> not the real presence. And in the, in the Catholic Church, uh, we know, uh, if you read John 6, uh, you know, in the Gospel of John, you could see it plainly what Jesus mm -hmm. is uh, telling us there, that uh, we believe is body, blood, soul, and divinity uh, in the sacrament. And that's a, uh, it's wonderful to come to the table of the Lord. It's, it's just, uh, <laughs> just incredible. Uh, it's, it's so rich. It's so, and you know, another thing is, one thing I, I, I must say about being in Protestant churches, which helped me a lot, Marcus. Yeah, right. I met some wonderful pastors and wonderful people who love the Word. And you know, when I was reading the Catechism, St. Jerome says, if you're ignorant of Scripture, you're ignorant of Christ. Mm -hmm. So when you, when I, you get into the Word and, and know what he's, the richness of who he is, uh, his nature, his character, why he was, you, you know, it becomes so full that when you go to the Lord's table, you, re you receive more of him. Thank you, Dean. I have a great email we've got to look at here. This just shows you how far your testimony has gotten tonight. This comes from Father Edward U. Ohm, Marine Corps Air Station, Futen Ma, Okinawa, Japan. It says, Dear Marcus and Dion, thank you so much for, for a great show. Being a high-profile entertainer, and since your conversion and coming back into the Catholic Church, have you learned of any other high-profile entertainers since your conversion that have found the Catholic Church? May our Lord and Our Lady continue to bless you always, sincere, Father Ohm. Praise God for that email, isn't it? Well, uh, I know Perry Como goes to church <laughs> <laughs> right up the street from me, at our, you know, uh, and uh, but uh, I'm right now. I've just been so localized, uh, I'm sure there are many, but... Uh, That's right. Uh, Father Ed, thank you. <laughs> we talked earlier, and this is kind of in that, but you and I talked earlier about sometimes the dichotomy that exists between the writer of a song and their depth and what the song says. That sometimes the Lord is able to speak through people, they don't even get it themselves. Talk about your experience of that with some of these people you worked with. 
Well, you know, I work with so many talented artists that uh, are true seekers. They seem to be, uh, but you know, uh, there's one problem. Sometimes you're in love with the search for truth, mm -hmm. but coming to it is another thing because it demands a response and it demands a change. Mm -hmm. So you become in love with the search and really not the truth. So coming to it is another thing. So I, I, f I find a lot of artists, and I don't mean this to like uh, bash or sound self-righteous, but so many of the guys, that I, they, they write such beautiful songs, spiritual principles, and they write these, <laughs> you just, I love listening to the music, and when I'm hanging out with them, it's, it's almost like they don't get their own message, <laughs> you know, but it's there. Yeah. And, you know, who am I to judge it, and God knows their heart. And, but sometimes it's not connected. Their actions and what they're singing, it's like, and, you know, and I'm old enough now to see that uh, a lot of the guys that I knew died very broken, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, very sad. It's sad, you know. Uh, but it's, you know, some, some, instead of saying, why me? You know, some, when I enter the church, I fall on my knees, I'm like, Lord, it's so good to be here. Thank you so much for touching my life. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you found since coming home. How's it feel to be back <laughs> to the church of your youth? I don't want to get fancy with this, Marcus, <laughs> but uh, like on a Sunday morning when Susan and I go to Mass at uh, St. Jude's uh, Catholic Church in Boca, I, I, I'll be sitting with her and... Uh, I just say, Susan, it's so good to be here. <laughs> it's so good to be home, you know. Uh, it, it's more a, a, a settling, you know. You know, Marcus, I got to say this. As a rock and roller, freedom is a big thing, you know. I used to think uh, you turn up the amps, you get loud, and you rock out, man, and you're free, and you're going to express yourself, and, you know, who cares how you feel? This is the way I feel. Yeah, and, and that's all right. That's all right uh, to express your feelings like that. And, and to me, uh, rock and roll at its best was always uh, just, you know, uh, just expressing your individual freedom and your individuality. And I used to think freedom was doing anything you want. And if I could, you know, as long as maybe if you didn't know about it or if, if I don't hurt anybody, you know, I could do whatever I want. But that, that's a myth, yeah. and that's a real lie. Uh, I didn't know it then, because I didn't see myself accurately. Uh, only true freedom only comes in the midst of authority, doesn't it? And, and you know, we're talking about authority tonight, and, and I was hated authority. I mean, I, I didn't like it. You know, it, it scared me. You know, it's like, whoa, don't tell me what. The kid is here. Yo, what do you want to know? I'll, <laughs> You know, I'll handle my own life, thank you. But I want to tell you something. Uh, I come to realize that infallibility and conscience, now, here's to infallibility and conscience. That's real freedom. Yeah. Uh, for me to grab a guitar and play anything I want, and you to pick up a guitar and play anything you want, is like, that's chaos. But if you know the scales, if you know what chords relate to what chord, if you know the structure, then you could just, you could express yourself. You could have a, it could be Jimi Hendrix or Chuck Berry, just express yourself any way, you know, any way you want, you know. Let's, but, take, the, let's take this, this uh, phone call with a few remaining moments that we have. This is from Rich. Hello, Rich. What's your question for us? Hi, Marcus and Dean. How are you doing? Uh, Dan, I'm not sure if you remember, uh, back quite a few years ago at a concert you were here in Connecticut, we had asked permission to come backstage, and, and you, uh, you, you told the guy to let us come in, and my son was a teenager at the time, and I, we had come back, we were talking with you, and we, we told you that he was listening to Twisted Sister and Heavy Metal and all these other rock bands, and what advice did you have? And, and you had said, well, you know, you got to get out to the right music and the right stuff. Today he's a great friar Franciscan in New York. And, oh, and praise God. We've been listening to all your albums. You were a big inspiration to him over many of those years, and, and I, we've got every one of your albums, and he just we just play these things over and over again. Beautiful music. Great job. And also, by the way, there's a, a street in New York named Belmont Avenue. I think, I think you're aware of that. Sure. That's, that's how I uh, put together the... That's why I named the Belmonts. Yeah. 
Definitely. That's right. That was home turf for you. Right? I was going to call them the Cretonas <laughs> because Cretona Avenue, but uh, the Belmont Avenue, the Beaumonts, no, the Belmonts sound the best. Dion and the 17th. <laughs> yeah, <know>. yeah. <laughs> it's just quite right. <laughs> this, this morning, um, I was reading in 2 Corinthians, and I, this verse came to mind as I was thinking about where you've come. And it makes me think about those that are still in the media, still in the high high test music, in the front, headlights, influencing millions of people. And this is a testimony from Paul, who had been there, and then now he is at his conversion. He says, therefore, having this ministry, it tells him 2 Corinthians chapter 4, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. We have renounced disgraceful, upper-handed, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. To have that kind of changed heart, where basically you're becoming a witness for God. Your whole life is a witness to the consciences of all who can see you. And when I thought about that, I thought, like I said earlier, to him who has given much, much is required. And so the sense in which in your own life the Lord has put you in the places for millions of people to see you. And so now the Lord says, all right. He says, you must decrease. I must increase. Mm. And he did that by grace, didn't he, in your own life? Grace, my favorite word. <laughs> you know, the, I, I think, you know, I, grew, I was telling you about that macho Italian neighborhood. Well, I think today that the, the most courageous thing a man can do is open up his heart to his creator and to his Lord, to his Savior, to, to the one who created him. And men of faith have always been men of courage. I, used to, I was telling you about, I thought it was for weak people. Never heard that the Apostle Paul said, God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. If you want me to brag, I'll, I'll brag about my defects, my, my selfishness, my selfish self-centeredness, my fears, my dishonesty, my inconsideration. I'll brag about those things, but in weakness, God's strength is made perfect. That's today's epistle. I'd like us to close tonight's program with saying the Our Father together. And what I'd like to do is ask the audience to join us to, op to lift up before the Father all those in positions of the media, the singers, the writers, the Hollywood stars, all the people who are in positions, and they may be just blind to their lives and the meaning of their life. And let's pray that the Lord will open their hearts because they have such an influence in so many. And with that prayer, I want to throw in Father John Harden, who's today, it's, I think it's 80th birthday and his 52nd anniversary as a priest, on the influence that Father Harden has had on so many, bringing them home to the church. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dion, what a wonderful privilege this has been. How much time we have? A couple seconds? Let's do a little couple more words from some old song we'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are, I love a girl in the room. <laughs> I'm taking them on the road, definitely. They even look better than the Belmonts. It's too bad. <laughs> it's too bad the, the audience couldn't hear that at home because uh, we're having a good time here tonight. Now let me. I want to see the choreography. <laughs> Come on to the left, to the right. Now a split. <laughs> oh, you all right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Dion, our prayers are with you and in your continued ministry, ministry of music. The Lord continues, like, I think you're going to England soon to do some stuff, right? And yeah. Opportunities open up. Yeah. And uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that opens doors. And it's all, they open you know, doors for good opportunity. Life is so full of wonder and opportunities, and we'll be about my father's business. And uh, Marcus, I, I got to say, I thank you so much for uh, the journey home and blessing my heart and blessing my family uh, through yeah. the wonderful uh, guests you have on. and. Uh, Press like yourself. Information. Thank you. That's like, thank you very much thank for that. Thanks for joining us tonight. Be with you again next week. 
And uh, as I often say on the program, we're on a journey together. Let's keep each other in prayer and serve the Father. God bless. See you next week.